before we launch into that. Okay. Um, cool, sorry, just checking the messages as they're coming in. Now, sharing screen. Screen one. Get rid of that. And okay, so I'm in the same place I left off last time. I hope you guys had a chance to watch the tutorials from last time because uh, not only the ones that I recorded for this group last week, but then also the recording that I made for the Friday group because I continued on. And that's sort of what I'm doing here is I'm trying to spread the tutorials out a little bit more. Um, it makes it makes it so I can cover more ground that way while still checking in with people. So um, what I where I'd ended up last time, if I come back into Faceware Retargeter, try. Uh, we just have to reload the performance that we had. So we open, and it still remembers where all the last stuff was that I left off. That's fine. Um, at this stage, I no longer needed to continue to set playback range or frame rate because it's already done that for me. So I'm just going to hit OK. And it saves off information in its own proprietary files associated with uh, Retargeter about the different keyframes that I've created here, the data that's associated with those keyframes. Um, I can always just hit OK for this disabling auto solve. So I can just get past that. And where I worked last time was just on the browse for Amanda. Um, and so we had our neutral frame. We had one frame where they were sort of a little bit more up there. These were all auto poses that Faceware chose for us, right? We got one there, and we got one there. Um, now, even looking at that there, I might even be tempted to say, um, it just feels like the, the brows are kind of going up. If I was animating this on a, if I was using this as reference footage, for instance, on a character that is looks more like her rather than a realistic character, what I would naturally do in my planning is I would sort of push the brow up a bit more like that. So I think I'm just going to exaggerate this a little bit more um, based on the fact that this is a more stylized character rather than just one that is just totally trying to rep uh, recreate realism here. So this is a little bit of me going in there and using my animator's judgment. Uh, so we'll see how that turns out. And however, I know that within this sequence, there's going to be a lot of other brow shapes. So I've only asked it to give me three. So what I'll do now is I'll usually go in and say, all right, find two more. Find two more poses here, um, auto poses, and I'll go through and I'll calculate two more frames. I'll just use update poses with scene values. And it's going to now give me 1198, all right, and 1551. Now, if I jump between those two, Oh, so there is a difference between them. All right, first I thought there wasn't. I just kind of like to compare because I don't want there to, in the same way that in Analyzer, I try to reduce the number of frames that there are um, not very much visual differences between. I want to also reduce it here in, in Retargeter because otherwise it can confuse the system. So I just kind of jump between these and just check how close are they to any of the existing frames. So like uh, 362 and 1551, they're they're a little bit close to each other. Like 362 feels like more a more intense version of 1551. So I might actually delete this one. When the auto poses start giving me results that feel similar to the existing poses that I already have, I kind of stop using them. And I'll just say delete. So I don't need to do, I don't need to worry about that one. Um, 1198 though, that does feel maybe a little bit more than some of the other um, expressions. So. It's kind of like 1053, but with less tension. I'm going to zoom in here a little bit. And what I'll do, just because I said it's similar to um, 1053. Now, by the way, sorry, one of the things I will point out is that um, a whole bunch of keyframes have been laid down here. All right. And this is because last time when I did this, I'd gone through and I pressed retarget after I did those first three frames just to demonstrate what the retargeting process looked like. Um, it laid down all these frames, and uh, now I still have them in my scene. So um, just pointing that out. And therefore, it's not as easy for me to just jump back and forth between the existing 
the, the main keyframes that I am that I have here. So I just kind of have to do it sort of in retargeter. So at 10:53 here, let's just set our timeline to start at 10:53, and we need to go up to 11:98, which will be make that as our end frame. It's going to hold down middle mouse click, oh, sorry, middle mouse click, and hold down and drag out to 11:98. Um, what that's going to do is it's just going to take all the keys that are associated with the browse on 10:53 and put them over here to 11:98. Keeps the same positions. Last time I also went in and I created a selection set for just all the browse controls. So I'll go in there now and I'll just hit S to key um, that. And therefore, what I would have now between 1053 and 1198 should be the same shape here. So that's why if I go between them, you can see that. If you just take a look at the other frames that are in between there, they're not going to have a, all the ones that were laid down during the retargeting process are not going to update until I hit retarget again. Um, and then it will retarget based solely on the frames that I have listed in here. So I'm just pointing that out for you. Um, OK, so like I said, 1198 is somewhat similar to 1053, but there are some differences. The brows are up a little bit higher here. So what we're going to do is we'll just move this up. And I'm going to go into my browse camera. I like to have in this custom shelf that I made for Daria, I like to have a few um, buttons that allow me to easily move between the cameras that I've created here. So if I were to just sort of show you how to do this, um, if I hit brow cam there. I'm going to enter into my brows cam, but I don't have an easy way to just add that to this um, shelf unless I come into my script editor. Which, if I click on this button here, it will launch my script editor. All right. So what I want to do real quick is it's going to press this to erase all the data that pops up here. I have history echo all commands turned on. And this way I can see everything that Maya is doing in the background. So if I go into um, panels, perspective, you can see all that stuff that just pops in there now because that's all that is, is the, the actual script that runs in the background. Um, and so when I hit brow cam now, I will get basically the data that, or the script that I need in order for this to update properly. So I'm just going to go in. It says look through model panel one, brow cam model panel two, update, and essentially, um, I probably don't need this set model editor types, but these two things here um, I will take. And what I'm going to do is it have those selected there. And I'm just going to press this button here, um, and this is going to save the current script to your current shelf. And we'll ask, you know, um, what do you, you know, what do you want this to be? I'm just going to call it brow cam. Um, this is a Mel script, by the way. All the default scripting inside of uh, Maya is uh, Mel. So we'll just say Mel. And now I can see brow cam there. So let's just see if that worked. I'm just going to go back to Persp. And when I click on brow cam now, it goes to the brow cam. And while I'm doing this, I'm just going to go ahead. Let me just see what happens when I turn echo all commands off, because it echo all commands does sort of crowd this out really quickly. Um, the history will pop up still, but you can see when I don't have echo all commands on, it's not showing me everything. But when I hit brow cam now, uh, unfortunately, it doesn't show me anything in here. So that's why I just wanted to check that. So I will need to have echo all commands on. Um, I'm just going to figure it out for the other ones as well. So I have I, I left cam. All right, so this is going to grab that one. We'll call that uh, I. L for left or I I left right that um, cam I won't be able to read all that but you'll see it there I left and then we'll do the same thing for I right cam and then face cam that's just going to be our standard cam. and mouth cam. So this is just a workflow thing that I like to do. I think it saves a lot of time in the end. All right, so let me close out of that. Let's just make sure that these are all working. So I click on mouth cam. There we go. Face cam, eye rig, or eye right, eye left, browse. Okay. 
And I might just move face cam over to the left hand side there. Um, I can move these by middle mouse clicking on them and then dragging them in the direction that I want them to go in. So I usually like my selection sets to my right. And there we go. So go back to browse. Um, oh, by the way, I was going to make sure I bring up you guys. I'm going to put them over. I'm just going to make sure I put you over here on the opposite side so I can see if anybody has any comments that they want to type in that I actually see them pop up. OK. So having done all that now, um, just going back and forth here and comparing these two frames. So if I take a look between those two, basically I can see that these markers pull out toward the sides a little bit more, right? Earlier they were pushed in. So I'll start by kind of pulling that back a little bit there. And it is also going up, so I'll pull it up. But this is less, um, has less tension in it than this one does here. Like these ones, as I was saying, they kind of curl up and in, whereas at 1198, they're more just sort of rounding out. So it is here that I would actually, I would probably keep that at about that height, but I would start to pull this one up a little bit more. And so yeah, pull these guys up a little bit more here as well. And this one can probably straighten out a little bit more. And again, just comparing before and after how much lateral movement has happened. So I've said that this just pushed inwards here, but the rest of them don't really seem to move too much. This one might be able to move a little bit over in this direction here. Although I don't think it's going to make too much of a difference. So too much. Um, this other side here, probably just going to do a very similar kind of adjustment. Pull that up there. Um, push this back in this direction a little bit. Back there, pull this up here. Oops. Pull that up there a little bit. There we go. Um, and now just kind of comparing them before and after. Feels pretty decent, I think. So, um, all right. So that gives me another auto pose frame here. The only thing I want to do now is, like I said, if I started adding more auto poses in, the auto poses are starting to look a lot like the existing auto poses. So I'm just going to scroll through a little bit and see is there anything using my visual judgment? Are there any other brow poses in here that I feel that I have not really uh, managed to capture in this sequence? So let me just, I'm going to bring this down to a 500 sort of frame interval at a time. Um, and, you know, the brows are great, but they don't have that much freedom of movement. So um, the, you don't end up usually having to create as many poses with them. I feel like right here, maybe at this, right about here, I think. It just, what feels to me is like the outer brow is raising a lot more than the inner brow here at 161. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna add this in as my own custom pose. So I'll say add here. So I'm not using get auto poses, I'm just saying add. Um, I don't necessarily need to give it a name. I just leave it as whatever it is, uh, but I'm going to go in and I'm just going to pose this one at 161. And I will want to compare this to other existing poses that I have here just to make sure that I'm being consistent. So what's the next pose that is the most similar to it? Um, so this one probably that I just did at 1198 is probably the most similar to it. The main difference being that uh, at 161, the inner parts here push down a little bit more. So I'm going to copy off 1198 and bring it down to 161. So let's go to 1198. Set my beginning at 161. This just makes it a little bit easier. Middle mouse click and drag. Actually, uh, go in and make sure I've selected all my, my brows there. Middle mouse click and drag down to 161. Hit S to key. And uh, so these two should be the same now. 
they are. All right, and I'm just going to make some adjustments here at 161, pulling down there, pulling down here a little bit, and then to see what other differences there are. So the outer parts here can come down a little bit more as well at 161. And maybe I might take those, I might take this part here and actually pull it up a little bit more, pull it over here a little bit more. Pull that down. Same thing on this side. And having done that, what I kind of feel is that what I'd originally done at 1198 here, I should have probably pulled this up a little bit more, to be honest. on both sides. So sometimes you, you start to feel like some of the other poses that you've made need adjustment based on the new the new changes you just made. So that's not uncommon. I think I can go with that. I think that for the most part is looking OK. All right. Um, so continuing through here, just looking through at the other any other poses that the brows go into, how well are they being accommodated? So we've done that one. We've done something similar for that one. And done 1053, so we've gone into there. Pull this out to 1592 here. And I think I think we're most likely we have what we need. Yeah, most likely. So and so the only question is here at 1540 or 1533, is that any different from what was the other? Which one was the other one? 362. So we said fifth there to 1533. Okay, so 362 was actually already more powerful. So that's all right, cool. Okay, so what that basically means is that I've I've captured most likely all of the major poses that I need to do for the brows here, which is good. I'm going to go ahead and save first before I do anything else. Um, and then I'm just going to go ahead now and retarget based on the existing frames that I have here. So I'll say retarget. Let it do its calculation. Update poses with scene values. And it'll take it a moment. Um, because what it's going to try to do is to calculate, I think, not just the brows, but everything. So um, we'll see how that goes. <laughs> the more the more frames you have, the longer this takes. And I'll let that just do its thing in the background. Give it a moment. <laughs> um, by the way, just remember that if you are having any, any uh, difficulties with the um, anything technology related, including like accessing the um, remote access things, make sure that it you do uh, get in contact with IT because they're the ones who will give you the official details on how to proceed forward from that. OK, um, I think this is finished now, so let's just see what we get from it real quick. Just watch it through from the beginning, and then we might look, watch it in some sections. There is 
Um, what we have to understand with this too is that it's not going to give us a perfect result. It's only going to give us an approximation. We're going to have to go in and be animators um, after the retargeting process. So, uh, so long as it gives us a good base layer, though, that's what we care about. Let's look at here. It's from zero to 500. One of the things you'll notice is that most likely the time that the brow takes to get to its maximum point will usually not be on exactly the same frame that Daria gets there. So we will have to do some timing adjustments later on as well. Also notice that the brows start going down before her brows really start to, before her actual brows start to go down. So again, other things we'll just have to go in and fix. Uh, but we're not doing that until we finish the retargeting for everything else. There is a little bit of jitter going on right here, you know, some instability. I don't think that that's anything that I'm going to want to try to fix through the retargeting, though. I think that's just something I'm going to try to fix later on, because if I look at just the control there, right, and I say this is between um, from about 80 to 123. If I looked at the graph editor, Windows Animation Editor is graph editor. It's going to drop that into here. Um, if I looked at the graph editor here, it's primarily a thing on Y Translate. So if I'm looking at translate Y, see that between 80 and one where I'm at right now, there is a little bit of an up and a down. Sometimes there are some arbitrary ups and downs, and we would just go in and want to um, manually remove some of this, this data. We're not doing it right yet, but I would probably end up flattening this out more or less as needed. Um, there's also going to be a little bit of jitter there, probably on Translate X. It's kind of unavoidable, and that's why you have to be an animator, not just a technical artist. OK, but I'm not seeing anything in that section that's actually worrying me, though. They go up, they go back down, they scrunch down. I feel like they could potentially even push in more here, like what would happen? I'm just curious. I just want to know what this would look like if they came in like that. What would happen if I really push that up there? You know, I, I maybe I want to really push this hard here. Again, this is not something I would normally do. Um, but if I, if I was working in a more realistic fashion here, but because this is more stylized, I might want to. So this is 362 is the frame that I was originally made here. So I might actually update what I'm doing on 362 as a result. I might decide to push this in more. Um, maybe even pull them down a bit more here. And I'm going to pull this up a bit more here. I don't want to pull it too hard where I get too much of a crease. But I'm going to pull it up a little bit more there. All right, so what I'll need to do is I'll need to retarget based on that, but um, let me just scroll through for the rest of 500 until we get to 500 here and see what we have. So, all right, um, let me just open this back up to 1592 here and retarget based on that. Um, any any questions on the, the workflow so far? Or does it seem relatively straightforward? I'm trying to like explain all of my thinking process through it because I think a lot of what you get from just the plain old tutorials uh, that Faceware provides don't go into the real exp uh, explanation process. It's technical, but it doesn't tell you why they're making the decisions that they're making. And a lot of this stuff was a mystery to me when I first started with it. So it's the kind of stuff that I've learned as I've been working. So if we go back to that section 362, now we can see that there's a lot more intensity there. And I'm just kind of curious to see what that looks like over time. Okay. Feels a bit more angry there. Cool. Um, Jamie says it seems like it makes sense. Hopefully, once I actually try to do it, it'll be smooth and won't suddenly not make sense. That's always the challenge, you know. And that's the that's the annoying thing. When somebody knows what they're doing with something, they can show it to you, and that it will just look easy. And then when you try to do it, because you're less familiar with it, then it looks a lot harder than it appeared 
in the uh, in the tutorial. So that's one of the reasons why I keep saying make sure that you guys give yourself enough time. I'm able to do this faster now because I've done it more than once. I've done it more than twice, <laughs> you know, done it several times now. So with different kinds of characters. I'm noticing quite a bit of movement up and down right now on this nose bridge, which is kind of interesting. So that might just be something that needs that will have probably a certain amount of jitter to it that it's going to have to manually remove. And you can kind of see what I'm thinking here is if I look at the values. Um, 0 0.05, these all these values here are probably actually meant to be at zero and it's just picking up some jitter. Because it gets a little bit confused there. And so the overall trend here is probably it goes up, it comes back down in a nice graceful curve and stays flat. But this is something that I'll clean up later. OK, so if you start to see jitter, so long as it doesn't just go wild and wacky, then um, it's probably OK. All right, so um, and then pulling this out to 1592. There is a OK, so what I'm noticing right now is there's a little bit of lateral jitter that's going on there, which is kind of interesting. Which means that that's stuff like on translate X. So if you look at translate X, you can see here. Yep, you see some different definite lateral jitter that's going on there. But again, it's not so bad that I can't just go in and sort of mas massage this later. One of the things that we'll notice, though, is like a, a keyframe has been made for every frame and we're dealing with 60 frames per second. We're going to eventually tear this down to 24 frames per second and I'll show you how. And then even then we're going to um, not have a frame on every frame. We'll pro probably space it out to about a frame every three to four frames. Or I should say keyframe every three to four frames. And yeah, so I'm just coming along here, a little bit of movement up and down. And then no, it's doing its thing again. All right, cool. So I would say that that's probably all right. So I'm going to save that. Um, I'm going to go in now and I'm just going to save scene as. And we'll call this retargeting O2. And I'm just going to go ahead and call it browse. That way I know that the browse have been done at this stage. And um, now what I can do is I can start moving on to the next face group. I always like to have those little appended names, just like I did with the analyzer file. OK, so um, I wouldn't move on to cheeks yet, but I would I would start with um, probably go down to eyes, I suppose. Take a look at the eyes. All right. So um, let's go in and tell it to give us some. Well, before we do the auto poses, let's just go in at frame zero here and lay down um, the um, key, well, actually, sorry, before we do that, before we invested in that, a couple things I want to do. I want to turn, so we have Amanda's face here, we have Amanda's eyes, all that stuff, and I keep sort of clicking on it. I can turn off geometry selection if I wanted to, and that would solve it, but I could also select all the geometry and put it onto a layer here and, and, um, and whatnot. So what I might do is actually select all by type uh, geometry, right? Now, does that, I'm just curious, I'm just going to go in and add a new layer with that stuff on it. Uh, unfortunately, unfortunately, when I do that, it is selecting also these NURBS curves because they must be somewhere in the hierarchy, um, a part of that geometry. So just curious if I go in, say select all by type polygon geometry. OK, so that seems to not select the curves along with it. So let's go ahead. I'm going to delete this layer. Delete layer. I'm going to add a new layer with that selection. There we go. So that turns off the polygon geometry. For, unfortunately, that also turns off this because I guess this is technically a polygon. Um, I will select my uh, faceware plane here and it's going to right click and choose remove selected object. There we go. And let's just call this um, Amanda Geo. We'll give it a color or something and make it that red. 
All right. And that way now what I can do is I can set it not to template mode, but to reference mode, and therefore I can still see it, but I can't click on it, which should make things a little bit easier here. Um, it's going to pop back into Persp real quick. I should have actually created a Persp camera up here as well. In fact, I might do that just because I want to have all my cameras available to me. I know that my style is very rambling. I apologize if that doesn't work so well for you, <laughs> but I do like to try to articulate all of my thoughts. And uh, Maya has perhaps frozen, which is what Maya does occasionally. This is also why I save frequently. All right, hold on a sec. I'm going to kill Maya here, and we'll come back. It's never clear why it does that. In this case, it wasn't like a memory issue or anything, but who knows. Concerned that if I did that, what? Uh, see, the trouble is, is that Maya crashes. It doesn't remember its preferences because it writes out the preferences when you um, close it, which means that I've lost all my cameras up here, which is a bit annoying. So apologies while I redo this. Um, set project. Daria set. So don't worry, Maya crashes for me as well. Maya crashes for everyone. And of course, the thing to remind people is to always have incremental saves enabled. So file, save scene, options. Make sure incremental saves is on because that will save your ass often. All right. And right, let me just redo these cameras real quick. OK, clear that out. Uh, so we'll start with Persp. Echo all commands, edit, history, echo all commands. Um, panels, persp, there we go. Persp. Normally, I wouldn't have to do this because normally um, all these would have been saved out when Maya exits, but not when it crashes. So. I'll show you a way that you can save that out uh, to make sure that this doesn't happen again. So, brow cam. Oops, sorry, getting lost there with what I'm doing. One of the things I do like about Maya is that once you understand how it works, it does reveal a lot of its back, uh, you know, all, all the code base that it works from, which can make it really easy to uh, modify and customize. Cool. So that brings all those back up there. Um, I'd also gone in when I'd done this and chose Windows Animation Editors Graph Editor. If I just hold down Control and Shift and left click on that, it will add it into the shelf as well. 
So in case Maya should crash again, I don't want to have to do this again. So what I'm going to do is just click on the little gear icon here on my current shelf and say, save all shelves. And that way it gets uh, saved out now and I don't have to wait until Maya uh, closes in order to do that. So um, going here to the eyes, actually let's go to the first view or face, first view is fine. Um, I want to create a selection set for my eyes and we are going to say, let's grab all the things that we would normally associate with the eyes. Oh, we got to put her back into uh, selecting all by type polygon geometry. It's going to deselect this guy. Add that to a layer, command to geo. This is what we've had done before. Save, there we go. And I can reference her now. Save there real quick. Cool. So um, I'm going to drag a selection around. Yeah, I'm going to include all these eye controls. So I'm just going to come to the side here so I can better see this. Drag selection around all of these eye controls here. Make sure I don't. all the eye controls, I believe. And if I remember correctly, I had, in, I had included all these upper cheek controls as part of the eyes. So I think that should be fine. I'm also going to include um, that and that. But not the big one. All right. So we're going to add that as a selection set. So we'll go into say um, modify. Where is it at here? Where's my sets? Or my, no, sorry, it's under create. Create, sets, uh, quick select set. And we're going to call that eyes. Say add to shelf. And is that one? Yes. I wonder why the browse icon is different. That's a bit odd. I'm not sure why that is. Um, but anyway, it does it does what I need it to do. A little bit of a weird kind of um, there. Okay, sorry. It was a little bit of an error of trying to zoom in there. I don't know why I was doing that. Okay, um, having done this now, let's go in and take a look at eyes in general. So the as I, as I click on the eye selection set, you'll see that there are no keyframes down here, which is important because it's very different to browse. The browse obviously have a frame created there. So we're gonna go in here. We're gonna go all the way back to frame zero create our first pose for this. And actually, remember, we'd already done this. We'd already created a pose for our neutral frame. So so long as we identify this pose here within Facewear, where did Facewear go? Facewear retargeter. I'll have to reload this in as well. So long as we do that, we'll be fine. So eyes, all right, and we're just going to say here, add at frame zero um, that current pose, right? And this is just going to say neutral frame. Uh, what are people saying? Sarah saying, just for later, are we having another feedback session next week? Uh, since the holidays, I assume not. Are you okay, PME? Yeah. So we don't have any. We don't have anything next week or the week following because it is the holidays. Um, I do expect you guys to continue working though. And if you need to get in contact with me, yes, you can private message me. Uh, Jamie says, sometimes when I create quick select set, it doesn't add to the shelf and I have to do it again. Any idea why it sometimes doesn't work? Um, no, I don't actually know. Uh, besides, like when I go to say create sets, quick select set, and just choosing add to shelf, I would presume that if you hit add to shelf, it should add it to whatever the current shelf is, unless your shelf is so busy, like one of mine is. So um, 
you know, where is my custom shelf? Cancel. This shelf here, where if I add anything to it, you now there's actually another look, another level beneath it. So I don't know if that's the case for you. Um, OK, yeah, I don't know why. If it does it the second time, then just do it more than once until you get it to work. All right. Um, so what we need to do now is just go in and say, hey, let's go get some auto poses. So we'll start with three auto poses to, to begin with. And let's see what it see what it thinks it needs. So we'll go to 688. All right, so she's looking up there. And I left cam. Let's just go to face cam real quick. Um, So I'm just going to start. I'm going to do this one eye at a time. And I remember I said that my rotation is primarily going to come from uh, this controller here. So as long as I'm consistent with that, that should work fine. So as I roll that eye up there, notice that it, there's a lot of auto um, sort of auto drag happening here. If I roll the eye down or up, the eyelids are following along with that. And that's all well and good but I might want to exert more custom control over that. Um, so let's just see real quick if this gives me the opportunity to turn off that drag. Um, and see, we have this option here called auto lids. And if I turn that off, then as I drag this around here and roll this up, then the lids don't follow. OK, so I'm going to make sure that auto lids is turned off here. I'm also going to want to go back to my neutral frame real quick and also turn it off there then. OK. Um, having done that, Joe, though, notice how turning it off has actually caused this to go in an, another direction. So what I'm going to do just to help out with this real quick, I want to keep the same shape that I had there, but I'm just going to set my timeline to something really small here. I'm just going to go to frame uh, one. So I'm going to copy things out from, let's make sure I grab my controls here, Daria, and we'll say eyes. It's going to middle mouse click and drag out to one and hit S real quick. So I, keep that out there. So I get the same stuff on both frames here now. I'm not going to pay attention to what's going on over here. Um, what I want to do now, though, is at frame one, I'm going to turn off or actually, no, frame zero, I'm going to turn off auto lids. All right, so turn that off there. It is off there. Here at frame one, I'm going to turn it back on. All right, and that's going to use this as a basis for comparison because I'm going to have to dial in the lids now at frame zero, which means that my up lids, I'm going to have to pull, oops, which way do they go? That's closing them. I want them to go up. So I might need to use. These are things that you, you know, I'm figuring out how this rig works as I as I use it. So, um, okay, just looking at how these controls are managed here. I'm looking for all the different controls that I can use. So that just that just goes in and controls them closing more, but not opening anymore. Um, let me check on, go back to perspective view here. Uh, what I'm going to do real quick, this isn't going to really help you see what I'm doing, but I'm going to show you what I'm going to do. I have my, my perspective view currently open, and I'm going to choose panels, tear off copy. And what that's going to do is it's going to open up uh, my perspective view in a, in a separate window here, even though it says side view. It's not actually it's a perspective view, obviously. I'm going to put that over here on my other screen. And that way I always have a perspective view open. And here I'm going to go back and choose I left cam. Okay, and that way I have a perspective view. Oops. A perspective view that I can easily access. And this will help me get to things like this controller that's way over here, for instance. Um, I wanted to click on that just to see if there were any additional controls here to help. And I don't see any. So I think some of this. So I'm just going to have to use these controls. I was trying to see if there was a controller similar to the functionality of these lids here, um, but that didn't just close them, but also opened them, and perhaps there isn't. So um, 
Let's go ahead and try to pull this up a little bit. It's going to compare back and forth between 1 and 0. So I'll pull that up a little bit, pull it over a little bit. It's pretty close. Pull that over a little bit. It's a little bit of extra kind of um, point that's going on right there. that out. Not too bad. It's pretty close, though. I think I could be happy with that. And then the bottom ones here, I've got to pull them up as well. Exact, but it's close. Okay, so I think I can live with that for the most part. Uh, I'm going to want to do the same thing for the other eye. So go to the right eye. We didn't copy these controls, I don't think. Oh, you know why? Sorry. I have to click on this first here, so we got to turn this off here. Auto lids, turn that off there. So I'm very pedantic. Just right. Pay lots of attention to detail. It's pretty close. I think I can live with that. All right, cool. Um, now I can get rid of frame one. So I'm just going to go and select my eyes again there and delete frame one. OK, so that way now we have now we've gone in and made sure that the what the eyes are doing is correct. It looks the same way that it did before, but with turning off um, the auto lids feature. All right. Um, so let's just go back to the other side. I'm going to save real quick. And we'll go in and we'll say uh, I left where we started out before. And we're going to want to come out to frame 688 here. So there we go. So we'll go in and we will rotate this. Make sure I have auto key on. I do pull that up. Pull it over here. All right, and as the lids go up now, just pay attention to what we had before. So um, we'll just open it up to 688 here. The What I'm trying to pay attention to here, let me just zoom in, is the difference in position of the eyelid itself. So as we can see, the eyelid has moved up, it's rolled up a little bit, and it's also kind of changed shape here. So the shape here is going like this, whereas before it was much more, much uh, more gradual. 
So we need we need to get the sense of it going up here. And that will start to reveal the iris a little bit more. And also sort of pushing it over in this direction a bit more. And so doing, we're going to want to sort of widen this out a little bit. I'm just kind of curious, just want to turn off the visibility of this real quick. Let's see what this guy does. No, it doesn't do anything there. Okay. Um, what I wish there was was a little bit more control about the shape on this side of the eye, but there's not, unfortunately. as good as we're going to get that upper lid right now. Um, there is a little bit of movement that's happening here in the socket region as well. You can see that the, some of the skin here is pushing up, which is what these controls are for. So you want to just let that roll up a little bit there, kind of going in these different directions a little bit. Maybe not that one. Um, that way it feels like, you know, is having an effect on not just here, but also the skin immediately surrounding it as well. And even the corner here of the eye is going up a little bit, so that's where I can pull this up ever so slightly there. And then that's also pulling up the skin here, which is where these little controls come in. So we want to be constantly thinking about what effect um, not just the major controls are having, but also on the, the the more minor sort of secondary parts of the skin that are being pulled. This needs to come up here quite a bit. We want to get this nice shape that goes up here and then sort of more or less straight across. Uh, remember, that's look at where it's lining up with the corner here. So even though it's nice and straight right here, it's not actually lining up with the corner so much. I'm going to just to make my life a little bit easier here, because these eye these eyelashes are so strong, I'm going to put them on their own layer. Eyelashes. All right, I'm just going to turn off their visibility real quick, because it might be a little bit difficult to see some of what's happening here otherwise. That corner goes up a little bit as well. Pull that up slightly there. I need to pull this up quite a bit more. Oops, not on this frame, sorry. Wrong frame to be adjusting things on. So this corner goes up a tiny bit here. And I'm just going to pull this up quite a bit to about there, I think. I might, I'm just trying to look at the distance between here and here. Just going to sneak rotation here a little bit more. And pull it down slightly. Might cause me to pull this over here a little bit more. That's a bit better. Um, Maybe I won't pull that up too much. Maybe I'll just leave that at zero. Let me just compare before and after. I also want to feel like these guys are pulling up a little bit more here. Maybe a little bit right here as well. Turn Amanda Geo back onto a reference there. I really go in and I and I try to really examine what's going on here. I try to pay attention to what every control is doing. Making sure everything feels like it's working as a system and that there's no 
there are no parts here that are just sort of sitting in isolation from each other. Okay, so I think that that's probably okay there. And yes, this is what I expect of you. Um, I expect you to go in and, and really have this much of a, um, have this kind of approach to the, the project. Pull this up slightly. There's a lot of, you know, a lot of back and forth as we try to figure out what's working. I wish there was another control right here to change the shape of that, just as I wish there was one over here. So why when I make my own rigs, I add in quite a few controls around the eyes. All right, so there's that side. We'll save that. Make sure, because I'm, I'm working one side at a time, I'm just going to go over and make sure I do the right side now before I move on to the next thing. The amount of rotation will vary from eye to eye because, you know, what's happening on the left side is not the same as what's happening on the right side, even though the eyes more or less rotate the same amount. But um, if I was looking at this from the front view, sorry, if I look at it just from here, you can kind of see that based on this angle, this this eye here looks like it's rotated more towards screen left than this one is. So I want to make sure that whatever I'm doing here matches that. All right. Um, so the same process here. Make sure we start to rotate things up. Remove them up. And I'm just gonna really quickly here have kind of just a face cam view just to make sure that the amount of the, the height here feels like it's moving up about the same amount. So this moved up. 1.851, that's probably close enough or pretty similar. It doesn't have to be absolutely perfect, but I just want to make sure we're getting something similar. And this one's moving off in this direction a bit more now. It's also going up. And now, because I moved that up to the right height, I'm going to still need to pull the eye up a bit more here. All right. And pull this guy up. Before and after. I think <clears throat> the curve over here might be a little bit too strong, or let's just see here real quick. Maybe this can go up a little bit higher here. that out a little bit. Cool. Um, pull these guys up a little bit here.
feels like more or less everything is moving as it needs to. I think this eye can still rotate over in this direction a little bit more. And also, I just kind of want to compare the rotation over here, which was it's not on that one, on this right here. Negative 25 and negative, or negative 26 and negative 6. Negative 20, yeah, you know, so let's pull this over just ever so slightly more. We'll pull it up here a little bit more, negative 26. They're going to rotate up about the same amount. It's the lateral amount of rotation that will vary. So I think that that's good. OK, so that gives us one eye. If we turn the eyelashes back on, we can kind of get the overall sense of what that looks like. The eyes are going to be more complex, obviously, to um, to pose. And um, it's not really a surprise given that they have more controls. But you do need to be especially um, careful with them because not only are you trying to get the shape of the eye right, you're also trying to make sure you're getting the correct proportional distances between the irises and the lids and the pupils and the lids and all that sort of stuff. It's very important that you get that right. <clears throat> okay. Um, what are the other ones that it says we should do? 1016. All right, so we get the eyes kind of bunching up there a little bit. We also have 1030 where the eyelids are closed. Let's just do one that's a little bit different where the eyelids are closed. Uh, how do I want to do this? No, I'm just going to do an order. Sorry. Um, so we'll come out here to 1016. And here we have the eyes over here again. Let's just compare before and after. You can kind of see that the, the eye uh, itself is in about the same position. It's just rotated down here. So what I might do is go over to 688, grab just the two controls associated with the rotation of the eye there, and pull that down to um, 1016 here and just hit S. And that way, at least we know we're in we're in the right ballpark. And then I'll rotate these down here at 1016 to sort of better sit where I need them. But we're going to also have to move the eyelids to get a sense of what that proportional distance needs to be. Um, oops. Sorry, just checking to see if somebody's messaging me. OK, no. All right, so I'll rotate this down here, a similar amount. And now I'll come in here, I'll just do my right eye again. Or sorry, my left eye again. And again, I'm always comparing after. As you can see here, if I really zoom in here, I look at the shape of the eye in general. Between 1016 and the previous frame, the shape of the eye doesn't change very much. This is just the lid comes down ever so slightly. So what I would actually do is probably go in and actually steal what I had over here at um, at this frame. I'll steal it for most everything. In fact, actually, I think what I'll just do is to make things a little bit easier is I will copy off that frame down here. So 88, start there. Select all my eyes. And middle mouse click and drag, copy that down to 1016, hit S. I'll have to rotate these down now, but that's not a big deal. Rotate that back down. And, um, you know, if I put my mouse somewhere here, if I put my mouse like right there on the corner of that, that iris, and I go to 1016, I can see that it's, if I just scroll down there, it's pretty much exactly in line maybe an ever so slight lateral adjustment, but very, very minor. Like I think any of that there is just a little bit too much. I make my gimbal a little bit bigger here so I can make those big adjustments, those little adjustments a little bit easier. Um, and yeah, so now I'm just gonna go in and make some adjustments to the overall shape of the eyelids. Let's turn off those eyelashes again. down a little bit. Sorry, I'm 
just kind of, sorry, one thing I'm just checking here real quick before I get too heavily invested in what I'm doing. Okay, so I come back to zero. I'm just looking at the differences between um, Amanda's eyes here and Daria's eyes. Daria, I think, just has her brow is maybe a little bit lower compared to her eyelid. Um, yeah, okay. Sorry. Ignore what I'm doing. I'm just wanting to make sure that I don't need to actually open up her eyelids more than what they are. Um, I think I'll be where, they're, where they're at. Okay. Um, so we pull these down a little bit. There we go. The overall shape stays pretty much the same. And if we compare before and after on the eyelid itself, we'll see that the corner of the eyelid has come down a little bit there. So we can pull that down slightly. This definitely comes down quite a bit more. It's kind of changing that overall shape there because here it was rather flat. Now it has this nice curve to it. I'm gonna try to preserve that curve as well as I can. Pull this down a little bit more here maybe. Right at zero. And I'm just going to pull this over. Maybe I'll grab it with this one here. Pull that over there a little bit more. This overall shape. Open that up a little bit more there. Yeah, I really wish that there was an easier way to get this nice kind of like more angled look, but I can't, unfortunately. So those controls just don't. I try doing it here. I'm just kind of really kind of changing the overall shape of the eye. I don't want to do that either. Um, okay, I'm going to pull this down slightly as well. A little bit less tension there. Same thing here. Uh, actually, even though the eyelid is, the eyelid's kind of pushing up a bit more here, I think. So it's just a, maybe kind of doing that a little bit there. Really exaggerated. And also, I'm just getting a lot of tension here underneath. There's like a lot of um, actual um, squinting kind of going on there. And I don't know if we have a control here for squint. I don't think we do. So I'm just going to have to kind of dial it in through these controls here. I have to pull those up a bit more. Definitely pretty heavy over here. You can see if I pull it up too high, I start to get some kind of nasty crunching going on there. But I, there is a little bit of a line going on there, so it's not too, it's not wrong to try to add some of that in. Just gonna have to soften some of it out here. All right. And I like to go into my perspective view just to make sure that what I'm looking at here um, makes sense from other angles because it's really easy to kind of get lost in that. If you're only looking at it from one angle. Okay, something like that. And yeah, I think overall. I think overall that should be good. All right, I'll save that again. Um, now what I notice here is that the pupil should be sitting right, the bottom of the pupil should be sitting right there. It's not quite covered, or if it is, it's ever so slightly covered. And the distance from here to the eyelid is probably not quite as much as what we see here. Might be able to pull the eyelid down a little bit more. I'm thinking, so maybe something like that. Okay. Let's 
feel like this rotated up slightly more than it is here. So. Yeah, it's a bit odd. <laughs> I'm just gonna look at the face cam here real quick. But that might make a certain kind of sense. I only look at this eye. All right. Other eye. I think what I'm going to do actually is um, just because I, I don't want to just keep sort of doing the same thing over and over and over again. What I was going to do is um, I will go back and and do this eye, but I'll do it on my own time. What I want to do now is to just go in and have a look at um, the last frame that we had here at 1030 where she closes her eyes just to see what uh, we might have to deal with, with when the eyes close. So I'm going to go back to the left eye here and go up to 1030. And let's just compare the frames before and after to see where is it relative. So the corner here stays pretty much the same. Everything else kind of relaxes. So the lower eyelid is going to get relatively straight here. The upper eyelid is relatively straight as well. Um, sorry, turn that off. Shush. And down to zero here it is. Pull this back down to zero. There, good. And um, what I'm just going to want to do before I pull that in is I just want to see, get a sense of where that that eye was. So I'm sorry, I'm just going to go to 1016 here. Keep this a really narrow frame range. I just want to see where that eye in general was located. So it's kind of right in the middle as that eyelid goes down, which is somewhat somewhat useful. Um, I'm going to set its rotations back to, oops, uh, well maybe not quite at zero because that's not exactly where we were seeing things here. It's it's up a little bit. Pull it up there a little bit. Maybe something like that. It's kind of staying, it'll be rotated up about the same amount. So that's rotate X. So we'll put, put the rotate X up there about negative nine. Something like that. All right, um, now what we're gonna do is just gonna try to close the eyes. And as we close them, pulling that down, we're obviously going to need to adjust some of the shape here as well. Uh, you know, zero for the eyelids is there. And zero for the lower ones is there. And that's where they're meant to properly close. But they may close at not exactly that height, that same height, because that seems like a pretty, I'm just trying to get a sense of whether or not that feels appropriate. Yeah, it might be OK. If it is, though, I'm going to have to pull down this corner. Because I want to get those to kind of align, the, the outer edges to kind of align. I might pull that up a little bit there. Pull this up a little bit here. I don't want them to intersect each other, the eyelids. And also something to keep in mind is sometimes when the eyes close, they're not 100% closed, and that's the eyelashes kind of cover things up. But I think in this case here, those eyes look relatively closed. If I pulled out to slightly later, yeah, they don't, they don't actually close any more than that right there. So I'd say that's probably pretty safe to assume full or very close to full closure. Like I might, I might pull this one up a little bit more. I feel like maybe if the eyes are not just closing, but like also pressing down a little bit more, then I might get a little bit extra room there. So I'll leave that like that. Okay, something like that. And just trying to get the overall shape of the eyes a little bit more like Daria's. Okay, 
Um, so going back and forth here, there still is a similar amount of tension um, under here. What I might just do is go in and grab those guys and I'll just take their position. It happens when I key them there. Yeah, I might pull this down just a little bit, but it adds a little bit of that tension going on there. Um, with the eyes closing like this, if we watch from as, they, as the lids actually close, it's gonna pull down the skin. So we want these guys to start pulling down as well. Relaxes them. First it starts to relax them and then it starts to pull them. I pull in a little bit there as that goes in like that. It's kind of pulls in laterally a little bit. Okay, so I think that that probably looks pretty good there. And um, so that's how I would approach doing the eye, doing a kind of a lid close, for instance. With the eyelashes positioned the way they are here on Amanda, I guess maybe because I can see part of the eye in there from this angle at least, I might decide to close those eyelids a little bit more. Yeah, I would just go in and I would just close them a little bit more. So oh, that would be that side there. And I think that that's kind of where I want to stop with the tutorial right for today, just dealing with the brows and the eyes. Um, you know, and as you go forward, you're going to also have to deal with the, the lips and whatnot. I just want to point out one other thing, though. Um, I'm going to save this real quick. There is a plug in here that I'm going to ask you guys to use. And let me just go and find it real quick. is usually in week five, six. Okay, so there's a plug in here called um, Red9 Studio Pack, and I'm gonna put this into the content for this week. Um, there might be an updated version to this as well, and I have to go and check. But, um, oops, where did it go? I was gonna pop this out of here. So the Red9 Studio Pack, I'm gonna put this onto my desktop here real quick and extract it. I'm going to extract to the folder. And when I double click on this and just have a look at it, uh, there is a bunch of um, stuff in here. And it's important that you read stuff like the README. Um, actually, that README doesn't tell you anything that you need to know. So the install for this, what you need to do So what you need to do is you go into a little installer folder there, and then th this is where it tells you what you need to do. Um, installation the system is designed to be booted as a standard Python site package. Um, so what you can do is you can copy uh, the Red9 folder to your Maya scripts directory, um, and that's primarily what you need to do. However, you're also going to need to rename the folder as well. Um, and so what I've done is if I come in here to my C drive and I go to my standard Maya directory and I come into scripts, you'll see that I have a folder called red9. And inside that folder is the exact same content that I see right here. So all I've done is I've created a folder inside my scripts directory called red9. If I just copy red9 underscore studio pack dash 2.75 and I put it into my scripts folder, it's not going to work. Um, what I need to do is I need to change the name of this to just red9. All right, so I just eliminate anything after red9 and just keep that there. But basically all you need to do is to um, place that here and you would need to, re um, to restart Maya in order for this to load in. Once you've done that, in order to launch this plugin, 
I'll come back into Maya here, pull it over. There is, um, I've already created a, a button for this myself. So if I just came over to my custom tab, um, do I have my red nut? Actually, no, it's, it's probably not under this. It's probably here. Do, do, do. See, I've created this little Python tab here called red nine. And that's going to launch the script that I need to use in order to do this. So I'm just going to really quickly press that. I'm going to show you what that script is. So if I come in here, maybe into my script editor, see if my old side to crash now. Because it liked to crash last time. There we go. Um, if I right click on this and just go to open. There is this. Um, this script here that is what actually launches Red9. Um, and you'll find that also in that little readme file that I just showed you. Get rid of that. Get rid of that. Um, right here. So if you basically copy and paste what you see right here, uh, this is the same thing I have here. I just got rid of the comments section from it. So import sys, sys.path.append. And you just need to change the directory that this points to here. This is currently pointing to, you know, the his C drive, but you want to change it to your wherever that path is for you. So you could just easily go in and find that here. Click on that, right? I copy that, paste that up here. Make sure you put it between um, apostrophes. And then when you click on this to run it, import red nine, red nine start. Um, basically copy all that, copy, and you would open up a new Python tab down here. So you know, if I click on a little plus sign here and it says mal or Python, I could just click on Python. It would open up a tab that says Python, all right? Paste that right here, select all, um, and control enter to run it. Now it doesn't look like anything's happened, but it has. In fact, actually you can confirm by seeing the new red nine menu up here. And all I do with this now is I would just go in and um, have my current shelf that I'm working from, so my Daria shelf, and I would just choose add my currently selected um, script to the shelf, and I just call it Red9, right? Um, and from this, Red9 is going to make life a lot easier for us. I'll tell you what it does. Um, I'm going to go back to the browse really quick here. So let me select my browse. And let's go back to just looking at the browse in general. Um, the browse, remember, we'd gone through and we had retargeted them. So we have keyframes on all of those frames. And ultimately, sorry, I'm just going to hit save before I do this so I don't lose anything. Ultimately, I'm, I don't want there to be uh, 60 frames per second. I want there to be 24 frames per second. So in order to um, change my frame rate here, let's just take a look at what happens in the graph editor when we do this. So if I open up my graph editor, pull it over here, and all my browse selected, and if I just kind of look in here at, at any given time interval, I can see that these all match up to, uh, each, each keyframe matches up to a specific frame. If, however, I go in here and I choose 60 frames per second and change it down to 24 frames per second, what it's done is it has reduced the overall number of frames. Remember, before I had 1592, 1,592 frames, and now it's reduced it to 636.8 frames. Um, so we actually have fractional frames now, which we really don't want. Uh, it has reduced the overall number of frames, though, by uh, to 40% um, of the original. But as you can see here, if we really zoom in close, that between 230 and 231 now, we can actually see that there's about two and a half frames per, uh, or actually two and a half keyframes per frame interval. So we really don't want that. We don't want fractional frames like that. So what we can do now is we can use Red9 to kind of help with this a bit. So if I go in here and I just select all of my browse that have keyframes set for them, after I've um, activated Red9, what I can do is come in here to curves, and it's added in um, a couple uh, options here. 
So red nine randomizer, interactive simplify, and inverse key times. So we're going to choose interactive simplify. All right. Um, oops, where did it go? Pull it out here. Unfortunately, it doesn't grab focus. So let's, let's pull this over here. And the best way to see what's happening here is to just kind of zoom in a little bit there. Sorry, I have to tone every, tune everything up here. What I'm going to do is I'm going to choose the option snap to frame. That's going to be very important. That's what's going to get rid of the fractional frames. Uh, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to drag. I'm not going to type in a value here. I'm going to drag my um, curve resampler value until I get out to probably four. Right, and let's just see what it does. And what it's done now is it's tried to preserve the overall shape of those um, of the original frames or of the original curves. I'm going to undo real quick though, because I just want to I want to sort of show this to you in a little bit better way. I'm going to choose um, curves, and we're going to choose uh, buffer curve, and we're going to choose um, snapshot, and we're just going to basically create. A snapshot of what these curves look like right now before I make this change. So let's go back to curves, red nine, interactive simplify, and let's just do this again. Snap to frame. Let's drag this out to four. There we go. And let's see. Does that actually show us what I want to see? Uh, it's not actually showing me the showing me the buffer curves. But anyway, what it's done is. Um, it has done its best job to preserve the overall shape of the original um, curves. And it's reduced the number of frames that we have um, so that, you know, right now we're frame 120 up to frame 124. So it's basically a frame every four frame, a keyframe every four frames. Um, and that's generally how I like to work. Uh, so it's it does a good job with that. This is superior to Maya's built-in option for um, simplify curve, which does not do as good of a job of maintaining the original shape of the curves, nor laying out the keyframes in any kind of meaningful intervals. So um, that's why I use red nine. It helps out a lot in this sense. Um, yeah, so buffer curves visibility. I thought that I'd just turned that on, but let's just see here. Um, buffer, buffer, buffer. Well, can I see it here? View. Ah, you know what? There we go. OK. Um, that's why. So if I select this curve here, for instance, you can see this was what the original layout was. There's a little bit of noise going on through there. I'm not too worried about that because it's such a small interval. All right, so that probably is really just noise. And you can see that it's doing its best job to preserve the overall shape here. If I felt for some reason that this was not accurate enough, I could reduce the number of frames per any given interval. So I could maybe bring it down to once every three frames instead of once every four frames. Um, and yeah, so, but overall, this is the approach that I'm going to take. And I do have a tutorial about this on my um, YouTube channel, which I will share with you guys as well. I just wanted to point this out before I stopped for the day because this is going to be part of our next step between what we need to do after we um, retarget and before we start doing the cleanup. OK, um, so that's where I'm going to stop with the tutorial for today. Are there um, any questions or any comments about what I've covered so far? Yes, no, maybe so. Um, sorry if I missed you saying this already, but where do you find that plugin? Is it OK? Yes, I'm going to provide it to you. But if we just search for it, we'll just call it red nine plugin Maya. Right, red nine studio tools. And actually, looks like it's been acquired by Autodesk since the last time that I used it. So it's probably got an updated version here. Um, and I'll see what version is. Yeah, then now they've gone to version 3.0, so it's probably better. So I'll give you the most recent version. It's not yet, and it's not yet on Teams, but I will put it there today. Any other questions?
All right, so um, is there anybody who would like me to have a look at your current progress, um, either an analyzer or if you've gone to retargeter yet? Um, if you'd like me to have a look at something, please let me know. Yes, please. OK, Ashton, yes, please uh, share your screen with me then. Okay. Can you, can you see, see that? that? Yep, yeah, I can see it. Sweet. So for the eyes, I've actually purposely not put them on the points because they don't look really centered to me. So I just put them more in the middle, like the top ones. Um. So, so okay. So am I? Sh should I specifically be looking at the eyes as the region in question right now? Oh, uh, I guess just like everything in general, but. Okay. Because when when you said that you didn't put. What did you mean by didn't put them on the points? So. Like right there, do you see how the the dots there? Yeah. But I put them more here. Yeah, and I I agree with that. Um, I would even do that for the for the lower lid as well. Put it up matching an eyelash or something. Right. It's just on some people, it's easier to get those dots where I need them, and other times it's not. Um, yeah. Depending on the shape of the eye, for instance. Um, so in those cases, I might just follow an eyelash, the root of the eyelash. Sweet. Um. So were were there specific areas that you felt were in, were of concern within this? I mean, the lips were so difficult. Every single time they were just like snap out of place. Okay. Um, Can we take a look at that section? Yeah. I'll just play it through normally. It looks overall so far that it's doing a reasonable job. Took me a very, very long time. Yeah, well, it does sometimes. Yeah. Um, oh, just go back to where just, I guess that was toward the end of that sequence there. I'm just noticing that the um, inner mouth marker on the right-hand side seems to be in kind of a weird place. Yeah, I thought that too. Do you think I should move it over? Yeah, yeah, because it's... Yeah, it's. I think you, wherever your starting position is for that, let's just go ahead and I'm just going to request control real quick. Yeah. Um, this, this is going to be fun. I'm, I'm, re, I'm trying to control remotely, you controlling remotely something. <laughs> but, uh, I probably have actually like zero interactivity here. All right, go ahead and um, actually, I don't even see my. Yeah, I don't see you doing there. anything. All right, never mind. Um, so just go back to frame zero there real quick. Yeah, that corner mount, that that right corner, inner corner. So come not that no, not that one. The inner corner. So the the inner ring. Oh uh, here. Yeah. yeah, that one. That one's just in a weird spot. It should it should be you it should be wherever the <clears throat> outer okay, so drag it to the right. <laughs> All right, and down a little bit. Oh, kind of more like that. Yeah, maybe a little bit more to the left now and let go. So let's see what that ends up on. Yeah, that, that spot there probably is a bit better. Right, okay. Okay. And then... Um, what about the left one? Yeah, just try to make it seem following something similar on that side there. And then just try to make it consistent throughout what you're tracking. Right. Okay, well, I mean, I won't do it now because it's probably going to take a long time. Yeah, but, take a yeah. while, but... <clears throat> um. Because otherwise, it's just a bit of a weird shape. Yeah. Okay. Sweet. So pretty um, much. Just and I noticed that towards this. like if you get if you go to around frame five hundred there. Yeah. Some of those some of those uh, were just dragging in really at really odd shapes around those corners. And so I think if you bring it out to where I have you just put it, then it's going to solve some of those issues. Yeah. So it doesn't really matter if it's not like following properly so, so long as it's like always that. following the same spot then that's better but ultimately there is a the, i think with maybe anthony's mouth is slightly differently shaped than um 
normal. Than normal. <laughs> but I think that them being in more or less that spot there is going to be better. Yeah, overall. I agree. Okay. Um, are there any are there any existing areas of concern? Uh, no, I don't think so. Okay. Well, then it looks like it's overall doing what it needs to do. Yeah. Sweet. No, okay, that's cool. Thank you. Okay. Cool. Good. Um, anyone else? Uh, let's see. Sarah says I might pop in on tomorrow's class if you're going to be feedbacking then. Um, yeah. So tomorrow I'll just continue on with uh, some with, with the tutorial uh, a bit further, and I will. Um, so I'll, I'll start working in the mouth region for them tomorrow, and then we'll see where we get with that. And um, yeah. Anybody else? Um, may I? May I? Yeah. Sure. Yeah, I, I, I borrowed my friend's laptop, so I just tried to see. Oh, cool, I can. Can you see that? I'll give it a second. Yep. OK, so I, I just, I, I've done all the, um, all of the face parts, so I just want to make sure like they are, they're looking good. So I keep a neutral frame at the first, mm -hmm. at the beginning. Mm -hmm. And yeah, they look like that. Uh, I just play point white. Okay. There's a bit of a section there in the mouth that just messed up. Uh, which part? Go back to, yeah, right about where you're at there. Scroll forward. Yeah, right. it's, it just scrolled over it. No, no, you're too far back now. Sorry. Oh. So around frame 300 there. Okay. I was going to see if I can request control real quick, by the way. Oh, now. OK. See if it'll let me. Can you, can you? There you go. Um, why is, are you doing this on the school's computers as well? Uh, no, it's, it's oh. my own laptop. Oh, I don't know why it's not letting me interact with it. Anyway, just scroll forward. Just go forward there just slowly. Oh, oh there it, OK, there it I see that. Yeah. OK, cool. All right, yeah. so those. Uh, basically, just need to lock down. Find the first frame where it starts to mess up. Yeah. Okay. And then just re-keyframe right on that frame. Okay. But um, there's a you have an awful lot of keyframes between 200 and 300 for some reason though. Uh yeah, cause here Are, she like closed. That, oh, that's the whole face. Sorry, it's the whole yeah, face. Yeah. Okay. Whole face. Yeah. Um. Yeah, I get yes. a little bit worried when I start seeing huge clusters of them together. Oh. Uh huh. Because that's just that's usually going to cause more problems than it solves but um okay it's it's probably i mean as i was watching it though i didn't really see anything that stood out too much except for just obviously that that one that i, I mentioned to you yeah i, I totally didn't notice this yeah part. so that's what you get you just go scroll through really slowly through everything yeah um, but like the mouse like this is all right i it, it seems fairly consistent with the previous um frame so long as so long as the markers are tracking the exact same striations in the lips yeah right everywhere then that should be fine okay cool. all yeah. right yeah that's all good i think overall that's looking reasonable so okay. um it's only 475 frames though so that's awfully short uh i think it's 19 seconds it should be longer that's what? only that's only eight seconds. What? Oh, damn! I think I made a mistake. Okay. Uh, oops. Yeah. Okay. So is I mean, that... Uh, that that's eight seconds at sixty frames per second. Okay. Is that possible? Like, if I find a full clips and I just edit them into like two files? Well, the question is, when you the video that you brought in here. Yeah. Did you bring it in at 60 frames per second or did you change the frame rate down to 24 or something like that before you brought it in? Oh, I think I changed the frame rate. OK, well, you don't want to do that. Because uh -oh. <laughs> um, I use Final Cut, not Premiere. So like, I'm not very sure of the settings of Final Cut. Yeah, you have to watch what your ex export settings are. Yeah. 475 frames at 24 frames per second is approximately 20 seconds. Um, but yeah the the video should stay at 60 because otherwise what you're doing is you're cutting out 
Um, okay. A lot of rooms. Yeah, exactly. So it means I have to like start over. Um, I'm just trying to think about that. Okay. <laughs> um, Please. I'm don't. trying to think of the repercussions of it. Yeah. <laughs> Ashton says he's done the same thing. Okay. Damn. Yes. <laughs> um, look, I haven't had somebody do it before, so let's just try it. Let's see what happens. All right. Okay. But, um, in terms of the red nine stuff, you don't have to reduce it down to 20 or, you know, you don't have to reduce it to 24 frames per second in Maya because it should probably come in at 24 frames per second, presumably. Mm -hmm. uh, we'll see how it goes. All right. Uh, but should I start over? <laughs> well, I would rather just to kind I would rather just get a sense of if you parameterized this and brought it in just to yeah. see what it looks like. OK. OK. Yeah. Oh, good. Oh, uh, yeah, I know. I should start soon. Cool. Mm. <laughs> if I didn't, I would. I mean, it's, 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 since I've not had anybody do it before, it's worth it to, um, it's worth it to just do an experiment with it. Yeah, okay. Okay. Cool. Thank you. Cool. Yeah. Uh, do we roughly know the frame range on 60 frames per second with this? Well, that's basic math, right? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, that's what Sarah's asking. So if we know it's 60 times 15 as the minimum. No, you guys can't shy away from math. So the minimum is 900, and the maximum would be 1800. Um, you guys can't have a, you, you, you really cannot use, you don't like math as the excuse. Because you're working in animation, you're working in computers, you got to know, you got to be able to handle some basic math. <laughs> All right. So between 900 and 1800 frames is is the um, what you guys should be working from. If you if if people if the students in China who are listening to this right now, uh, you guys have a different limit. Your their limit is between 1800 and 3600 frames um, because they're doing a different uh, they're the same project but different um, requirements for them. And uh, yeah, okay, cool. Anything else? Anybody else? You're welcome. Yep, yeah, you were right. You were right. I just got to pick on you if you decide that you don't like math. <laughs> uh, um, all right, cool. Well, what we'll do is we'll wrap up here then, and um, I'll just let you guys continue on, and this will eventually be posted, I think for some reason Teams and Microsoft Streams isn't working well, so I'm probably just going to have to keep putting this up on YouTube. Uh, make sure you watch them, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And cool. I will, um, I'll talk to you guys later. Have a good one. See ya.